<laughs> hey there, welcome to Main Street Living. I'm Cheryl Nelson. Hey, I'm Quincy Carr. And I'm Danielle Alvari. <laughs> we have a fun segment to start the show today. I mean, the holidays are right around the corner. And sometimes you never know what to talk about at the family table, right? If you're having Thanksgiving mm -hmm. dinner or Christmas. Here's it some awkward. for you. So we're going to get to know each other a little bit. I'll go ahead and go first. And okay. I'm going to start with what are your two top pet peeves? Two? Okay. Yeah, I want two. Well, sure, you go first. <laughs> yeah. Right, All right. Mine. So number one is snoring. Uh, can't stand it. Can't stand it. If my husband involuntary, he gets elbow. I know it's involuntary, but he gets elbowed, and I just I can't do it. I can't because okay. I think I have the most sensitive ears. And then number two is littering. When people litter, or I see them throw trash out their window, oh, I get so angry. Okay, there you are. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> my, mine is mine is waiting. I hate waiting. That's my number one pet peeve. I hate waiting, especially if I have an appointment. Um, and I show up at that time and then I have to wait farther. I'm like, why did I make an appointment? So that's, that's my number one pet peeve probably. Sense. Okay. Um, yeah. My I don't have a two. pet peeve is me messing up. Like, I don't like to blame other people for anything. Like if it was my fault, like, and I can't stand it and I, I will beat myself up. From Aww. Aww. So that, so my pet peeve is me. I don't like me. Quincy. Okay. Yes, well, so that brings me, that brings me to my question then. Um, <laughs> What one word would you guys use to describe your fellow co-hosts? So I'll go first. Um, I think that, I don't know if people can tell, I hope they can tell on the show, but Cheryl is one of the most caring people you'll Aww. ever meet. So I just think, just Thanks. really think caring and nurturing, and you can't have that many cats without being a caring person. Um, okay. And Quincy, I think is just so authentic. And that is that is truly Quincy. Like he really does beat himself up <laughs> when he messes things up. And he's just, he's yeah. very authentically who he is. Absolutely. Oh, okay. I've got some as well. Um, Danielle, I would say you're probably the most witty person I know. <laughs> you, you always have the great transitions and how does she come up with that? So I think that's a great trait that you have. And Quincy, I love it that you're always so upbeat. You know, you, you always bring a lot of positivity. So that's awesome too. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much, ladies, uh, for you, Cheryl. You, to me, are the are the leader, the teacher. Um, yeah. I learn a lot from you. I watch you a lot. Um, and then Danielle, what you know, I was going to say the same thing about you. Like, I think your authenticity that allows you to be so witty. I think mm. that that is what makes you you up. So, uh, certainly appreciate working with you, ladies, and. Uh, my thing is, you know, speaking of uh, a love for each other, what's the craziest thing you've ever done for love? The craziest thing. The craziest Ooh, thing. You start. Yeah. Me, uh, I broke into a girl's house. Now, she left the window open and told me <laughs> to break into the house. My problem was I wore all black, which did not look good <laughs> on me. <laughs> okay. No, that's, that's see, we uh, we've talked about this though. We uh, Cheryl and I agree that it seems like men do the crazy things for love because we don't we don't really have anything too crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, we don't have anything crazy at all. I just wrote a letter to a guy I had a crush on in high school, professing my love to him, but then he didn't talk to me after that, so that was sad. <laughs> <laughs> that's not crazy, Cheryl. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it just didn't work out. That's all. Yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. But we do have right. a crazy well, good show coming up today. Yeah, yes. we're going to get to yours, Danielle, at the end. But we do. We're going to learn how to go axe throwing, throwing axes and hatchets. So stay tuned for that. that oh, has yeah. Something to do with and, mine. and we discover how a 1976 Trans Am helped a veteran. Plus, we're going to take a visit to the food bank, which is such an important place to visit this time of year. But first, if you are shopping for a real live Christmas tree, we've got some great tips to share with you. So don't go anywhere. We have that coming up next. Welcome back to Main Street Living, Quincy Danielle. I said this last week and I'll say it again. One of my favorite things about Christmas is picking out a real Christmas tree. I'm, yes. getting, I'm getting better. Okay, you're good. Getting, you're good. warming up to it? Christmas spirit. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I was uh, I was a little upset to see that you guys talked about Christmas trees last week without me. Um, so I wanted to uh, revisit this segment that we got to see about the Shady Pond Tree Farm in Louisiana. It's a Christmas tree farm that features over 45 acres full of exotic trees. You guys have Ooh. to take a look at this. Shady Pond Tree Farm is actually a childhood dream that began the moment that we arrived at Shady Pond when I was 11 in 1955. And it came into being because we were unable to locate Christmas trees in the local area. So I cut down a 30-foot pine tree and cut the top out of it, and that became our Christmas tree. It was the ugliest tree you ever saw. The process of selecting trees at Shady Pond Tree Farm has become a bit complicated this season because of COVID-19. But in, under normal circumstances, the rule is to walk out and ride back. You walk out looking for trees. Once you select and cut the tree, the tree is loaded on one of the big wagons and typically the customers will sit on the wagon and ride with their tree back to the checkout area. The time to come to Shady Pond Tree Farm is about 10 days before Thanksgiving. That's when we begin pre-tagging. Pre-tagging is a process where the customers come through, select and pay for their tree, and then come back later and pick it up. We track their trees with serial numbers on the tags. Then on the Friday after Thanksgiving, we begin cutting as you normally would. Once you have selected your tree and gotten it home, the most important thing is to get it in water immediately. It should not be out of water for over about an hour to an hour and a half. If you exceed that time, cut a very thin slice off the trunk of the tree to expose the cambium layer of the tree. The cambium layer is the vascular system of the tree and it's the point at which it absorbs water. If you ever allow the tree to be without water, where the water level drops below the end of the trunk, the trunk will seal over with crusty sap. And once that occurs, the tree is dead. We hear customers say that they put additives in the, in the water, like some people put Sprite, other people put Scotch, but it doesn't work. The, the water that you want is pure water. In truth, I have a concern about water that is intensely chlorinated. I don't think that's good for the tree. You can locate Shady Pond Tree Farm by going to the shadypondtreeform.net website. Look for the link on the opening page to contact Shady Pond Tree Farm. There you will find telephone numbers, physical addresses, and a map. Many people GPS their trip to Shady Pond Tree Farm. But the caution is when you get in the vicinity of the farm, there's a large sign at the, at the entrance to the tree farm that tells you you're here. Cus uh, Shady Pond has the, the honor of having customers from large distances. In the early years, we had one customer who was a truck driver. And he would stop, bring his 18-wheeler, get his tree, tie it behind the cab of the truck where the sleeper is, and drive from here to Virginia. But in more recent times uh, and in more practical terms, uh, Shady Pond's uh, customers come from as far away as Lafayette to the west and as far away as Biloxi to the east.
Well, uh, ladies, I can tell you, seeing that package again, it's it's really warming my heart with the Christmas spirit. I just may go real tree next year. I'm impressed. How big? Oh, wow. Big one? Small uh, steps, Cheryl. Small steps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like he, he can start with the Charlie Brown tree, maybe. There right. You go. Right. Well, speaking of holidays, I know people want to do some traveling. So who's planning a road trip? We'll see when we come back after the commercial break. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Now, uh, Cheryl Quincy, I'm sure you guys know the holidays are just around the corner. And for a lot of people, that means travel. But Cheryl, I know especially you, uh, very big into safety, right? And being prepared. Oh, yeah. Prepare with share. That's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, ladies, with Thanksgiving uh, being around the corner, you know, you certainly want your car in great shape when you're getting ready right. to travel. So nothing better than having a good relationship with your mechanic. So let's find out why the people in Arizona are tuning up with Grulix for car care. Check it out. <laughs> Hi, I'm John Jamison, Vice President of Grulix Automotive. I've been with Grulix 21 years. Let me tell you a little bit about Grulix Automotive. We've been around since 1977, family owned and operated, and we started in Scottsdale Air Park with a machine shop. We then expanded to automotive repair, and now we have 15 locations to serve you valley-wide. We can work on any vehicle, even if it's under warranty from the manufacturer. Oil changes, tire rotations, brake checks, different services, we can do it all. And it does not void your warranty. Grulix stands for honesty and integrity and fixing your vehicle right the first time. Overall, we try to save you money and keep your vehicle on the road with minimum issues. I'm Jessica Wright. I'm the marketing director for Grulix Automotive. The relationship with your car care professional or the auto shop um, that you bring your vehicle to is very important. A lot of people don't necessarily know what's under the hood of their car or what's making the sound that they're hearing or what repairs need to be done. And it's really important to trust the information that you're being told because you don't really know any better, right? So it's really important to be able to trust um, the, the advice that you're being given from your um, auto care professional. So our ASE certified technicians can work on all makes and models, including luxury lines, BMW, Mercedes, Range Rover. Bringing your car into Grulix instead of the dealership will save you money. Our staff is knowledgeable. We look up all services needed at different mileage intervals to help keep your vehicle on the road safe and working properly. Grulix has 15 Valley locations with a 16th on the way to better serve you. Look us up online. We have a 4.8 rating on Google, which is unheard of in the automotive industry. At Grulix, we make it very easy for you to bring your vehicle in. You can simply walk into any one of our convenient 15 locations around the valley. You can go online to grulix.com. You can give any one of our stores a call if you'd like, or if it's more convenient for you, you can schedule an appointment online. You go to the scheduling tab at the top of the website, choose the location nearest you, and choose your time slot, and there you go. We're here for you however you need us. We at Grulix emphasize on customer service. We want to make you feel like friends and family. We build trust with our customers one visit at a time. Come visit the Grulix experience. Okay guys, first of all, I have to say, uh, I love that they are family owned. I've been really trying to shop local and, and support family owned business late locally. So I love seeing that. Yeah. Yes, I love that too. And it's so important that you keep your car maintained. I think that's the key to my car lasting 330,000 miles and, and still going. Oh, Cheryl. <laughs> oh, Cheryl. Okay. I'm proud of it. Thank you. <laughs> all right, well, <laughs> stick with us. Coming up next, we're talking about how to stay connected with family. Hmm. 
Welcome back to Main Street Living. And ladies, uh, I don't know if you realize this, but the holidays are coming up and we're now a family, a TV family, and we're going to spend this time together. It's, you know, it's more important than ever, right? Aww, our first Aww. holidays together. <laughs> yeah, and they look a little bit different, I think, for all of us. I mean, we're lucky because we usually meet virtually, but um, for everyone this year, the holidays are going to look a little bit different. Some people are getting together, some people can't get together. So uh, here to talk to us a little bit how to stay connected during the holidays, we have mom blogger Nikki Jones joining us. Nikki, you've been on the show a couple times. We love having you here on Main Street, so thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Excited so to we're dying to know, what do you what do you have planned for the holidays? Well, I think one thing that is for sure is that COVID has definitely helped made us all get very creative with the way we live our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and one idea that we had was to kind of create a closed Facebook group for friends and family where you can kind of share those ideas and recipes, you know, pictures from your holidays. I don't know about you, but I have 9 million friends and, you know, social media is my life. So it's um, sometimes things get boggled down. Yes, Definitely. and sometimes you see posts that you really don't care to see. So it's great to have a Facebook group with just the family members. You're all in there together. And, you know, I think something else a lot of people are doing is maybe Zoom over the holidays. If you can't meet in person, are you finding that a lot of people are having a Zoom Thanksgiving? Absolutely. I mean, I think definitely, you know, having that live kind of more interaction with family, I think is super important. And maybe you will make your favorite recipe together or something that you would have done together previously, but you can't this time. I think Zoom definitely acts as a great way. So what about time zones, Nikki? Because obviously some of us are across different time zones. I know Cheryl and I are in different time zones. I mean, time zones, I actually love the idea of not actually having Thanksgiving live on Zoom just because, you know, I feel like it would be a little difficult and I don't really want you to see me sitting there eating or whatever it might be. So maybe you could create a time <laughs> that works with your time difference, then you could do a toast or you could do um, you know, a dessert or something else that's just more short and sweet, dedicated, but you'll still get that interaction. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's say you do want to host a small gathering. What are some do's and don'ts? And of course, you want to make sure you're safe and you're socially distanced. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think for me in my house, Traditionally, Thanksgiving was a, a giant buffet. You're self-serve until your your belly's extremely full. But um, having one dedicated person to go and serve everybody, maybe they're wearing gloves or they're washing their hands um, before and after, individually wrapped utensils, you know, the ones you get with the salt and pepper, I think, you know, anything where you're not cross-contaminating and having people touch multiple things. I think that's kind of the way to go with that. And Nikki, you have a lot of other tips, right? So you have a blog where you host a lot of other things. Where can people find that? SanDiegoMoms.com. I'm, you know, trying to get creative and do different things. So we'll be posting lots of fun ideas. Speaking of that, you're talking about fun ideas. Um, tell us about some of your fun ideas and maybe some of your favorite recipes as well. Give us some hints. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so I don't, I've only done one Thanksgiving dinner my, myself completely. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, you know, one thing that this time has made us all look back on or think about is kind of those traditions and those things that really make you think about your family. And uh, we make a Norwegian flatbread called Lefse. And it is so funny because I told myself I would never make it with my daughter. It was so labor intensive. My mom would just spend two days making it for us. And we absolutely loved it. And I think I might do that this year, you know, just because I think it's important that we we bring those things back and we remember you know, what this is all about, which is our family and our friends and trying to stay connected. So I think traditions and bringing those back. Definitely. And since we have the time, why not make the two day uh, dessert? We I love that. <laughs> I mean, well, thank you so much. Nikki. We so appreciate it. Yes. Before we go, though, what's your favorite dessert? Very curious. I am just a simple pumpkin, pumpkin pie gal. I don't know. I, I, I think too rich or too much. I just can't do it. So I, I love pumpkin pie. It's the only time I'll eat it. Yes. All right. I love the cranberry sauce. I'm one of the cranberry sauce girls. So I'm all oh, wow. about that. But thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. All right. Danielle, what about you? What's your fave? Uh, definitely pumpkin pie. I did not peg you as a cranberry girl. So that is interesting. Really? Ooh, yeah. And you got to get the Cosmo, that. the Cosmo to go with it. You know, the martini with the cranberry juice in it. Yeah. yeah. Anything cranberry, I love. And 
making the transition here, cranberry sauce. How about a cranberry red car? If you're really oh, into yeah. restoring old cars, we've got a great segment for you coming up next. And we're going to go for a ride, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Now this time of year, guys, reminds me of traditions and, and just classics, like pumpkin pie, just all of the classics, you know? Ooh, how about a classic car, in fact? Yeah, you knew where I was going, Cheryl. Yeah, like say in 1976, Pontiac Trans Am, get your wheel spinning, listen up. Our next guest is lucky enough to see cars like this all the time. Rick DeBrule joins us now with a timely story about a veteran and his car restoration. Welcome to Main Street Living, Rick. Good to see you. Oh, thanks. Pleasure to be here. So yeah. tell us about this story, because I know cars mean a lot to you. I can see them all behind you on your shelves. <laughs> yeah, I was one of those car geeks when I was a kid. I spent way too much time with, you know, car magazines and I took two <laughs> hours of auto shop in high school every day and actually worked my way through college as a mechanic. But I managed to figure out how to get paid for cars over the years. I've worked covering racing for TV networks like ESPN and NBC and do the Barrett Jackson auctions for uh, the A&E networks. And one of my other jobs is I'm a correspondent for the Cox Show Driven, which is all about car stories. We don't do car reviews, not technical. It's all about fun car stories about interesting car people. And, and one of them that we did just recently involves, a, a, he's an Air Force veteran by the name of Joe Barthuel, who has a very amazing story about the car that he first owned. It was a 1976 Pontiac Trans Am, but not just any Pontiac Trans Am. In this case, this was called a 50th anniversary special. It was a 50th Ooh. anniversary of Pontiac back in 1976. When he was a kid, he saw an ad for this car. And he just was so mesmerized by it. He thought, one day I really want to own that car. So, you know, life goes along. He's, a, he's a, in the Air Force. He's stationed out at Luke Air Force Base in Arizona. And one day he's driving along and he sees this exact car sitting in one of the parking lots where the pilots hang out. And there's a for sale sign on the car oh. itself. And he's thinking, this is it. The moment I've been waiting for, the chance to buy this car. When will we actually see this story on Driven? Because like the way you tell it, I can listen to it like a yeah, I know. I know you're a good storyteller. It's, it, yeah. it, it's, it's in the next episode of Driven that's going to be uh, on the Cox Your View system very shortly. Mm -hmm. So so it'll be out there. And and then, of course, we'll have it on social media as well. So so he, he, he ends up buying this car. It becomes their family car. He's got three kids. They use it for vacations, all kinds of stuff. He gets trans. He's still in the military. He gets transferred to Korea. And he can't take the car with him. And then from there, he gets transferred someplace else. And mm. so he ends up putting the, his car at his father-in-law's property out in a little place called Tolleson, way on the edge of the Phoenix area, literally next to a barn in the hot Arizona sun. And it just sits there and bakes for 20 years. The difficult part of this story is he ends up getting cancer. He gets colon cancer. Oh, and so about a year or so ago, they, they approached a, an automotive shop here in town, Blackwell Automotive, and they said, hey, would you be interested? Could you possibly restore this car for us? And the guy said, yeah, I can do that easily. It'll take a probably, get this, 24 months because it was in such bad shape. Whoa. Two years. Yeah. And, and a little bit of money, of course. <laughs> and, and, and so Joe is downhearted and he's like, okay, well, I don't, I'm, you know, I'm not sure how much time I've got, but he mm. walks away. His cancer starts, they start to have some problems. The chemo isn't working right. Um, and, and they begin to realize his time is limited. And so his yeah. wife, Jackie, who's a wonderful woman, contacts Blackville Automotive last Thanksgiving and says, you know, is there any way, any way we could move this up? And Tom Blackwell, who owns Blackwell Automotive, said, once he heard the story, he's like, I I've got to do this. There's just no way I can't do it. So instead of a 24-month restoration, they start to cram it into a year. Now you think, well, how hard can it be to restore a car? Right. But there's all these elements, the paint, the body, the engine, every. And this car, remember, it sat around for 20 years. It had rusted, degraded. It was in a horrible condition. That This is crazy. And we're almost out of time here, so I want to make sure we hear the end of the story. Okay, so so bottom line is he met, Tom Blackwell manages to get all the people together that have to do the job. Guys doing the interior, guys doing the engine, his guys at his shop. They put it together and do an amazing restoration job. And two weeks ago, 
we were able to see the reveal of the car where Joe and his oh, wife and his family came out. And for the first time since that car had been dragged away, they saw it and it looked, according to Joe, better than the day it was built, better oh. than the day he got it. It was in such perfect condition. And Joe, whose health isn't that great, yeah. got to go out and drive that car again. And I'll tell you, when he pulled out, out of the parking lot, onto the street, because they had they had hopped up the engine a little bit, give it a little more horsepower. He yeah. put his foot into it, burned those tires. You could hear him squeal it all the way down the street. <laughs> it was an amazing moment. Now that's an amazing, yeah. that's an amazing story. And, and you know, Rick, people can find out uh, more uh, with Driven. It comes on on Sundays um, and it airs on Your View at eight p.m. So thank you so much for that story. Thanks so much for stopping by. We can't wait. To thank see you. It. Love that. Well, you, I, once again, I could tell car stories all day long. And this one, I've, I've done a ton of car stories. This was truly special. I it was. So was the segment. Thank you for sharing that story with us there, Rick. Thanks. All right, guys. We'll have more Main Street Living after this. Welcome back to Main Street Living, Danielle Quincy. It's hard to believe that Thanksgiving is right around the corner and it's going to look different this year too. Oh, it certainly is. And um, I can say for a lot of people that's gone out and bought their turkeys already, uh, especially for this year, buying a turkey is a little bit harder due to job losses and COVID. Um, so our next guest is actually helping to fulfill that need. Uh, Jerry Brown joins us from St. Mary's Food Bank in Arizona. How are you doing there, Jerry? Nice to be with you guys. All right. Now, uh, Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about this program? Uh, we've been around for 53 years. We're actually the uh, world's first food bank. The entire concept of food banks started with St. Mary's here with a man named John Van Hengel in 1967. So for the past 53 years, we've been feeding the hungry of Arizona. And obviously this year is a year like no other. Yeah. Uh, for the past few years, going back decades, we've tried to provide Thanksgiving meals for all the families in Arizona who need them to the tune of about 12,000 turkeys, um, emergency food boxes, produce boxes um, out, out to the hungry of Arizona. We're anticipating that need may even be larger this year for two reasons. Obviously, the economic situation that we've all seen out there. And number two, because of social distancing, we don't think that families are going to be able to get together in as large uh, groups as they have in the past. So maybe a group of 15 uh, sitting around one turkey, maybe three groups of five sitting around three turkeys this year. So uh, we're definitely in need of turkeys and we've gotten off to a slow start this year in our turkey drive. Oh, wow. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Um, you mentioned social distancing. How has COVID-19 specifically impacted your organization this year? Yeah, you know, I don't think there's one aspect of what we do that we did the same as what we're do we did this time last year. Um, everything that we've done, we lost 80% of our volunteers right off the bat. Oh At the same time, the amount of food that we put out doubled and tripled uh, in the first few months. It slowed down a little bit now that uh, things have gotten back to normal before the latest uptick in COVID. But, uh, you know, we used to have people come into the into the food bank and get the food. Now they're driving, no contact windows rolled down with a National Guard member who's gloved and uh, masked, uh, putting putting food in the back of the trunk so that we don't have any contact at all with the with the with the clients. But uh, we're still even at a at the point where things have eased off a little bit. We're still 20 to 30 percent above where we were this time last year when it comes to the amount of folks who are coming here and 50% of the clients that we're seeing have never been to a food bank before in their lives. They've never wow. uh, never needed the services. They've come to a food bank before, but it was to volunteer, mm -hmm. was to make a donation. And now they find themselves on the other side of the line. Yeah, it's so many uh, changes. Um, and even without COVID, you guys have been doing this Thanksgiving drive for some time. So can you tell us a little bit about the drive? Right. So what we do is... Uh, we, we're open for three days, November 23rd, 24th, and 25th, the three days leading up to um, Thanksgiving. We're open mm -hmm. from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock, and it's a drive through model. It looks a little bit like a NASCAR pit stop. You'll see <laughs> six cars pull up, six trunks open, six volunteers loading the car with food. Trunks go down, six cars go out, and the next six cars come in. And that's how you're able to feed 12,000 families 
in three days. We've gotten to be pretty good at it. Obviously, we're going to have to change things a little bit this year uh, to meet with the current circumstances, but we feel pretty confident we're going to be able to help as many people as we possibly can. Uh, but we are 8,000 turkeys short of our goal with two, with two wow. weeks left of Thanksgiving. That's a little worse. You may have noticed there are other things going on in the news right now that may yeah. have, uh, have taken the eye off the ball for folks. So we're asking folks if they could please make a donation, about $13. If you go to our website at firstfoodbank.org, we'd put a turkey on the table for a family. We'll take care of the rest. We've got most of the food ready to go. It's those turkeys. It's that centerpiece of the meal that we're really missing. For yeah. Sure. Sense. It makes a lot of sense. And how can people help? And you've already said that. So, um, you know, whether it's donations with cash or just being volunteers and physically being there, I think that 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 goes along. Right. We can use volunteers all the time. Uh, as I said, 80 percent of our volunteers disappeared. The reason for that is companies are not in their offices anymore. Uh, we have right. a lot of convention business in Arizona. So those convention folks aren't here in those large groups of two to three hundred that come to normally donate uh, their time with us. Uh, it's right. come back about 50%. We've, we've, we've had the Arizona National Guard here helping us building boxes round the clock because we distribute, and this is a huge number, 50,000 emergency food boxes every month mm. uh, wow. around the state of Arizona. So in order to do that, we need that help. And thank you so much to the volunteers. But those for those of in, that are in the Arizona area and would like to come and volunteer, we are masked, gloved, distanced, temperature checked, the whole nine the yards. Whole nine yards. We're doing all of that, and you can feel very safe coming in here and spending a few hours helping your the community and your neighbors in need. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Jerry. That was that was so important, especially this time of year. So we so appreciate you coming on, and we hope you get those eight thousand turkeys. Thank you, and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Likewise. Happy Thanksgiving. All right, well, stick with us. Coming up, we're talking about exes. I mean, axes. Don't don't talk to your exes during the holidays, especially. But if you have any unresolved emotional issues, the next segment might help you out. So stick with us. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Ladies, I have to be honest, like when I was a kid, my mother told me I used to throw a temper tantrum a lot, but I never hurt anyone. I feel like I could hurt someone because of this next segment. You? Temper tantrum? Quincy. Uh, I'm right there with you. Uh, yeah. You know, I Can't think I did that as well, but guys, I've got a great stress reliever for you. So you may have seen or even tried throwing axes or hatchets at targets. I've done this myself. It is amazing. It's thrilling. It feels so good. Here to tell us more is Kim Bessie from Stumpy's Hatchet House. Kim, welcome oh, to Main welcome. Street Living. Hi. How are you guys? <laughs> good. So tell us about this experience because it's actually a safe thing to do. Oh, yeah. It's totally, totally safe. Um, we focus a lot on safety and making sure everybody understands the technique involved in throwing a hatchet. Um, we've never had any injuries <laughs> from it. <laughs> Everybody's been completely safe and everybody that leaves here is able to throw a hatchet. There's never a problem with that. We, everybody can sink a, sink a shot. We always make sure people leave here capable of throwing it. Gotcha. Oh, wow. Well, so, okay. So speaking of safety, obviously with COVID-19 going on right now, what are you guys mm -hmm. doing to be able to keep everyone socially distanced? Well, we've limited the capacity as far as the number of people allowed in the pits. We, they're called throwing pits. And so mm -hmm. we've limited it down to seven people per pit. And we've been alternating pit spaces so that people aren't like right next to each other. And we don't allow mm -hmm. any um, parties that aren't together to be right next to each other in large groups. Okay, so Kim, I have to be completely transparent. I've been uh, thrown out of a dart throwing a place <laughs> because I hit uh, everything but the target. So oh. what do you need to know <laughs> about throwing a hatchet? <laughs> what do you need to know about throwing a hatchet? So some of the 
biggest pointers that we give our guests to make sure that they're successful at it is to keep your elbow pointed at the target. Don't bring your arm out like you're throwing a softball. You want to keep it in when you're doing a single arm. And the other thing is to really keep those wrists nice and locked in. You don't want to wiggle them around. You want to keep them locked in and the motions coming mainly from your shoulders and your elbows. That's the same okay. thing that told me about the darts, but for some reason, it just goes elsewhere. So. <laughs> so, Quincy, you need to be in your own lane then. Keep everybody away from you. And so I've got a silly question. Is there a difference between an axe and a hatchet, and are they provided? So we provide the hatchets. The um, franchise has um, designated hatchets that we only use. Um, you can't bring in your own hatchet. And the difference between a hatchet and axe is actually the length of the handle. And axes are actually used to fell a tree, whereas a hatchet's used to, to cut the tree limbs off and the components down to nothing. Okay, nice. now I know. It's, it's not we have an example of this is our standard hatchet, and then we have a larger version, and it's an 18 inch version. Oh my People gosh. tend to like this one better because it takes a lot of the work out of the throwing, and they find more success with the bigger one. Yes, guys, oh I've gosh. done it before, and I've nailed the bullseye. Ooh, good job. Well, yeah, that I got does not surprise me, Cheryl. Yes. <laughs> that that axe looks like it's out of a horror movie. Uh, so what tips What tips can you give us for hitting the bullseye? And, and does wearing a flannel help? Because I think the flannel is very oh, stylish. Absolutely. You need to channel the flannel. Absolutely. Um, for hitting the bullseye, what you really want to do is make sure when you're coming down, as soon as your hand gets in sight of your eyes, you want to release it right then. And you want one mm. full rotation. And one of the uh, things that our throwing coaches will tell our guests is to just keep your eye on the point at which you want to score your hatchet into the okay hole. well clearly uh i'm kind of in the dressed category for throwing <laughs> so successful really quick uh tell us how we can get in touch with you and are there other stumpy locations around the country there actually are 24 open oh. at present and we have several coming um, including one in Huntington Beach, California. Okay. Um, so you can reach us at www.stumpies, S-T-U-M-P-Y-H-H.com forward slash fall river. That's F-A-L-L-R-I-V-E-R mass M-A. And um, we take our reservations online. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Right on target. <laughs> Cheryl, I think you could be one of the coaches. And then I maybe totally Quincy could. can graduate from darts. Yeah, you guys would be steps. so impressed with me. I mean, I might look a little scary holding one of those, but uh, I know how to get a bullseye. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a lot more Main Street living coming up, guys, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Guys, we've had another great show today, but I want to get back to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show, stuff to talk about around the Thanksgiving dinner table. And Danielle, we left off with you. We were talking about the craziest thing <laughs> we've ever done for love. That was Quincy's question for That's us. That's right. And you can get yours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so the first thing that comes to mind that something that was very tedious that I did was I, I asked a guy to the Sadie Hawkins dance. Um, and at our school, it was like a big deal. Like you do the whole, it's like a promposal, but but you do like a big deal every time you ask someone to a dance. So um, I sent him butter to his class all day. So I sent him like Wait. sticks of butter to each period. Like I would send people in with like a note and he kept getting butter all day. And then at the end of the day, he had a huge truck. And so I filled, my mom and I popped up tons and tons of popcorn and put it in his truck bed with like a plastic covering so he could like get it out easy. But like we covered it and we filled it with popcorn, like a whole truck bed of popcorn. It was insane. And then when he came out to his car, it said, now that I've buttered you up, will you go to Sadie's? Oh, oh my, I was wondering what the butter was for. I didn't know where you were going. Yeah. But it was butter. hilarious watching him get butter all day though. Cause he was so mad. Like he's, See, he's melting, so he's carrying around all day. That, and did he say yes? I hope. He did say yes. Yeah. 
So sometimes crazy pays off. Yeah, well, you kind of slipped and slid right into that relationship, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Quincy, where are you going with that? <laughs> butter. But you know what? I'm not going to play these games. Hey, I didn't say anything. I didn't. That was you. It was all you going somewhere else. Yeah, so. that was wild and crazy. Uh, that was probably crazy than me breaking into somebody's house. So. Yeah. We got kicked out of the dance, actually. So, <laughs> What on earth did you do to get kicked out That's of the dance? a separate story for another time. <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, all I do is send love letters to people. But yeah, yeah. apparently what mine wasn't all that crazy. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well as, far, as far as this show is concerned, you know, you don't have to worry about missing any of the crazy moments because you can watch it again on the go on our Cox Contour app. So don't forget to check that out, yourview.com. Yeah, we do have some crazy fun moments here. And it was always fun with you guys getting to know you a little bit more today. And of course, new episodes every Monday, 9 p.m. local time. So make sure you join us next time as we take another stroll down Main Street. Have a good one.